Okay, uh, I'd like to now uh, begin to explain why I feel that Nahum the prophet represents Messiah as baptizer. And he's associated with the group of constellations, the zodiac group we know as Aquarius. Uh, in, in past, in the days past, the Hebrew name of that constellation was uh, uh, translated a bucket. Okay? And there were three other groups of constellations. There were three other constellations associated with this group. Um, and one of them was the southern fish. So it's the idea of water from the bucket is being poured upon the southern fish. The southern fish representing uh, a man that is being baptized. And uh, John the Baptist was the baptizer. And he made a statement saying, I baptize with water, but there is one coming after me who bapt will baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. All right? Now, the Holy Spirit is also in this group and it's represented as the, it, we, most people see it as the, a, a winged horse called Pegasus, which is Greek mythology, which I don't think really, that's really been added in the past. And <clears throat> I think, I think, by the way, I think all these names originally are Hebrew names or Chaldean names. But it's the same language, almost the same. Because uh, Abraham came from Ur of the Chaldees. All right? So, um, anyway, instead of saying Pegasus, the horse, it, in Hebrew it would be Pek Ha Sus, meaning a flask of joy. In the scripture, when you read about the oil of gladness, so a flask of oil is pek ha shemen. If you said a flask of gladness, it would very closely be pronounced like pek ha sus. Again, Jesus baptized with the Holy Spirit and it's the anointing Holy Spirit oil of gladness. And the, the fourth uh, item in there is a dove. And when Jesus was baptized in water, he rose up, and then there was a, sort of like an anointing of the dove upon him. A dove appeared to come upon him. Okay? So a dove belongs in the picture of being baptized as well. So the idea of being anointed with oil, being baptized, uh, having this dove come on, symbolically saying that the Holy Spirit is coming upon you, and um, the bucket of water uh, being poured upon you at representing uh, a cleansing of the filth of sin and a newness of life, a re being reborn. That's the whole idea of being baptized. And you're probably wondering how, if you've already read the book of Nahum, how that book relates to that, and we're gonna we're gonna see it. We're gonna see it. But let's first go over to his name, Nahum. What does it What does it mean? It's if you look it up, it means comfort, and it does mean comfort, but not in the kind of way where you're sitting on your couch and you're comfortable on your couch. Always associated with the root word of his name, Nahum is a grief, first a grief, first uh, something that's, that's hard to bear and something that's horrible. When, when Jacob was, was first found out about his son Joseph being torn apart, but, you know, he was told that his son was torn apart by the wild beasts, he hears that news and he has an extreme horror and he tears his clothes and he, puts on sackcloth, 
and he sits there and he mourns and he mourns and he mourns and he cries and he cries and he weeps. And then it says that his all of his sons and his daughters rose up to try to comfort him. Okay? That's the word comfort that they use here. They use that they tried to comfort him, but he would not be comforted. All right? So first there's the grief, and then there's an action because of the grief. It's a person, uh, it's a, it's an attempt to comfort the person in grief. Now, within the person, there's an action as well. And when, and now the, it also, this word is also used many times for the word repent. Okay? Now repent definitely has to do with being baptized because, because you, you repent of your sins and then you bap, you, you allow yourself to be baptized in the water, which symbolizes a dunking into the water and rising up in a newness of life. And that symbolizes a, uh, being dead to, being dead to yourself with Christ on the cross and going into the grave with him symbolically and coming out up again in a newness of life and a different newness of life where it is now death is conquered. Okay? Sin is no longer with you. Death is conquered. And that's the symbology of it. And that's, he that's here as well. I mean, you're going to see these things in this book. And it's sort of like in there, but you don't really see it until you see it. Type thing. Um, so his name, Nehem, is definitely a part of uh, the, bap the baptizing scene. Let's go to one of the first times uh, this word is used. By the way, Noah's name is a derivative of this root word that means to comfort. And they called Noah, they named him prophetically because for some, in some way he was going to comfort us because of the curse to the ground. That's the way they say it when they, when they named them. It turned out, of course, you know the story that the ground was cursed with all the wickedness within it and within the men and women and everybody, the whole world was cursed with it. They were condemned. And Jesus said, I did not come to condemn the world. I came to save it. So Noah was one that heard and allowed the, the Lord to save him. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. That's the difference between Noah, who was saved, and the wickedness, the wicked people that would not hear, that would not condone to what God who loves them wanted to say to them. They would not hear their own maker. They thought, oh, it doesn't matter, it, I don't want to get too far, but that's again the symbol of salvation. This is the first group of signs that are in the season of salvation. After this is the fisher, the fisher of men, the fish, Pisces. And after the Pisces is the, the lamb, the ram or the lamb or Aries. And, and that has to do with overcoming and overcoming death and coming out of the grave. And, and Jonah is the prophet for that one. And, um, Hosea is the prophet for the fisher. Hosea's name means salvation. <coughs> okay. So, with all of that said, let's start to read the book Nahum, and we'll talk about this. Okay? Now, verse 1. The burden of Nineveh the book of the vision of Nahum, the Elkoshite. So, right, the first first thing he says is that this is a burden. And it's a burden of Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was a major, the major city in, in, of the Assyrian, of the Assyrian Empire. A couple of hundred years before this, Jonah the prophet was asked by God, to go to that city and tell them that he was going to destroy the city 
Uh, and he didn't want to do it, but uh, you know, you know the story that he finally goes to goes to tell them about that God was going to destroy them, and they the king hears it, the people hear it, and they go ahead and they proclaim a fast and they repent. Okay, so repentance already happened to the city of Nineveh. You know, they go, they they sackcloth and fast and and forty days and 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 God changes his mind and they live and they live to do something that the Lord raised them up to do, and that was to uh, take judgment upon his people, Israel, the Northern Kingdom. Okay. Uh, Ephraim, Ephraim and Manasseh from Joseph, and then all of the other tribes. There were um, there were eight other tribes. There were ten tribes in all that were part of the Northern Kingdom, and they were uh, worshiping Baal. By the time of of Ahab, it was the most it was got, it was as bad as it could get. God again, God has ra raised up this. The people, the Assyrians, to do what he wanted them to do against his own people, who he loved. He couldn't take them anymore. He couldn't do it. They just would not. They just would not work out otherwise. So this, like I said, this is a couple of probably a couple of hundred years after that. Maybe 150 years, I don't know, but it's many generations. It's a few generations after that, and they start to get what this what they call a a um, pride of life setting in, a pride of who they are, a you know because God allowed them to be great because He allowed them to be great, and they're thinking they're great because of, because they're just great and God has nothing to do with it but they're great and they wanted to go ahead and do some damage the way they did damage they were doing damage all to all lots of people lots of cities and stuff they were just becoming unruly and way worse than they were probably way worse I don't know how bad they were but they got really bad again. And they wanted to, and not only did they want to, they started to afflict Judah, Judah and Benjamin in the, in the, in the south. And that's where the temple was. That's where God dwelt. Now, God actually at the time wanted something like that. But he wanted to do it his way. And he, and he had a special group in mind to do with the Babylonians. He wanted the Babylonians to do that part. That was his will. And they wanted to do it without even asking. They were started to afflict Judah. And, and trouble him. And, and hurt him. Okay? And this is where, this is where, uh, this, Nahum the prophet and Isaiah is there at this time too. And we're going to get to Isaiah when, when he, Nahum mentions something that you can find better explained in, you can expand on in, in Isaiah. Anyway, Nineveh became a burden, a hurtful burden. And let's take a look at what kind of a burden. Verse 2, he says, God is jealous, and the Lord revenges. And then he says it again, the Lord revenges. He's furious. The Lord will take vengeance, he says it again, on his adversaries, and he reserves, wrath is in italics, for his enemies. So he's saying, the Lord's jealous, he revenges, he revenges, he's furious, he revenges and he reserves for his enemies. Who again revenges. Sounds like the Lord revenges. 
Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. That's what it sounds like to me. Now, why does he want to give vengeance? And who is he giving it? He's going to give the vengeance to Nineveh. That's the burden of Nineveh. Nahum is just carrying his burden of Nineveh around. Not the way Jonah carried it, where he had to go tell them that they're going to be destroyed. I don't think see this as this. I see this as I see this as letting Judah know that the Lord revenges. So they're getting afflicted by uh, Nineveh. The Lord's going to take revenge on them. Verse three: The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and I will not at all acquit the wicked as in italics. The Lord has his way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. So you get this second part of this. You get the picture of a whirlwind storm. And the Lord has his way in that whirlwind storm. When I see a whirlwind storm, I think, I think of um, the Battle of Armageddon, just a big whirlwind storm storm of all of the people of all the earth swarming coming swarming around whirling around the people of God and he's he says he has his way in that whirlwind he's going to have what he's going to do what he's going to do in that whirlwind and the clouds are the dust of his feet okay the clouds um Destruct, it could be destructive clouds. You know, he's, he, uh, the dust of his feet, uh, clouds like the clouds that, uh, baptize the earth. Another viable explanation for clouds being the dust of his feet would be noticing that Jesus, after his resurrection, he rose and, and he went into the clouds. And he's now seated at the right hand of the Father, above the clouds, and he's coming back through the clouds to, to get us on that day. Even though he's seated above the clouds, every now and then it seems that he gets, that he walks around and he meets people like Paul, whose name used to be Saul, before Saul repented, First he showed him the darkness by blinding him, and while he was blinded, he saw the light. That Jesus is who he is, and he was, he was on the wrong side, and Paul again repented and had a name change. From Saul, who was like a king, to Paul, which means little. Okay? So, he was little, but he was great in the kingdom of God. And um, so that is, uh, I think, one of the best explanations of the clouds and the dust of his feet, although the others apply as well. Okay, verse 4, there it is. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry and dries up all the rivers. Okay? Now right there, again, that's what happened when in the days of Noah. The whole earth, earth was covered with water. The sea devoured the entire earth. All right? And everything that had breath died in that. Okay? Um, but there, but after that, you know, there was, you know, after everybody died, there was still Noah and the, and the, and the other seven souls on the ark. And, they needed to land, and all of the animals and everything, they needed to land. In order for them to land, the sea had to dry. And there's, that's what he did right there. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry. Okay? He did that when he created the earth. He said, and let dry land appear. And he's letting dry land appear again. All right? And uh, then he says, and he dries up all the rivers. Now, when he when he uh, rebuked the sea, he actually was creating rivers. 
So I don't. I think those are two separate events, but there are two separate baptisms in the picture of Exodus. They are baptized through the Red Sea, then they go in the wilderness, and then they have to go across the Jordan River into the Promised Land. And that, to me, represents the second baptism of going into the land of milk and honey, the land of joy, the land of the fruits of the Spirit. And so at that that time, the rivers had to dry up. So at least the Jordan River, where they crossed over. And it did, and then it came back again. Verse 5, the mountains quake at him, and the hills melt. And the earth is burned at his presence, yea, the world and all that dwell therein. Okay, um, again, this, this is end time scenario as well. Don't forget, there's still another baptism to come, and that's the uh, lake of fire where the earth is, where all elements melt, as Peter says. Um, uh, and he will baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Okay, he's going to cleanse the earth. Of all the wickedness. There's not going to be any sin left. All, all that are not found in the book of life are thrown into the lake of fire. Fire is the second piece of baptism. Mountains quake, that's a six, the six seal type of stuff. And the hills melt, the earth is burned at his presence. Uh, he says that the Antichrist will be destroyed by the brightness of his coming. Okay? He will be destroyed by the brightness of his coming. The earth is burned at his presence. Yea, the world and all that dwell therein. Six, who can stand before his indignation? And who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by him. They they hide in the they they want to hide in the rocks. They say rocks fall on us. That's what that's reminding me of. Now, verse seven is for people like us. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and He knows them that trust in Him. Okay, that's for us. This this is the burden of Nineveh, but and they what they are given, when they're going to know and they're going to find out is the vengeance of the Lord, because because they start to go out of their bounds and they start to afflict his people Judah without him really wanting them to do that. They're doing that on his own on their own, and they have this pride of life, and they and. Uh, they have this sin of, of Babylon, mystery woman Babylon. And that's going to be brought out later. Okay, verse 8. But with an overrunning flood, he will make an utter end of the place thereof, and darkness shall pursue his enemies. So now we're back. With, verse 7 is for us to, as a sort of like glimpse of the goodness of God. But verse 8 is back to reminding us that with an overrunning flood he will make an utter end of the place thereof and darkness shall pursue his enemies. Now I know it says that he's not going to destroy the earth by water anymore. So this overrunning flood is symbolic. Um, and it's also symbol it's also involved in the symbolism of being baptized because you're being baptized uh, where the sins, Pharaoh and his armies are are wiped away from your life. You're you're separated from bondage of sin. You're separated from that. That makes you holy people, a holy nation, and you come up out of the water in a newness of life that is going to worship God in spirit and in truth in the wilderness. Darkness shall pursue his enemies. The weeping and gnashing of teeth. And they'll be thrown out and be out of darkness. Verse 9. What do you imagine against the Lord? He will make an utter end. Affliction shall not rise up a second time. So the affliction 
that they were doing against Judah isn't going to happen anymore once he gets a hold of it. They're not going to do it again. For a while they'd be folded together as thorns. They, like thorns are folded together and you, stay, you can't get them apart. They're, they're intertwined. Okay? And while they are drunken as drunkards, drunkards, they shall be devoured as stubble fully dry. So, you take the thorns and you throw them in the fire and they become as stubble fully dry. Now verse 11, There is one that comes out of thee that imagines evil against the Lord, a wicked counselor. I see that as uh, an antichrist may actually be uh, a Syrian descendant or a descendant of Esau, an Edomite. And, but Edomites and the Syrians were very, were very mixed as, as well into this area. So, you know, I don't know. But there is one that comes out of thee that imagines evil against the Lord, a wicked counselor. I think that's Antichrist, I don't know. Thus saith the Lord, Though they be quiet, and likewise many, yet thus shall they be cut down, when he shall pass through. Though I have afflicted thee, I will afflict, afflict thee no more. Looking about his people Israel, his people Judah and Israel. For now I will break his yoke from off thee, and I will burst thy bonds in sunder. Okay, he's talking to his people again, and he's going to break his yoke, that evil one's yoke, the Syrian yoke. And the Lord has given a commandment concerning thee, that no more of thy name be sown. Now that verse applies to Israel as it behaved at the time of Ahab. It does not apply to Israel that has endured persecution and is known as the remnant of Israel. Out of the house of thy gods will I cut off the graven image, the house of thy gods, small g, will I cut off the graven image, again no good, and the molten image, again no good, and I will make thy grave, for thou art vile. Okay, so, in other words, the wickedness of Israel that um, worshipped the false gods, worshipped Baal, uh, allowed Jezebel to rule, um, allowed Jezebel to kill the prophets, uh, the vileness of and the wickedness of his people was going to be cut off. That part was going to be cut off no matter, you know, he was going to have that, he was going to have no part of that. But now, verse 15, there is, again, this glimmer of hope here for, for the people that are his people, still his people, for the remnant type. Behold, upon the mountains, the feet of him that brings good news, good tidings, that publishes peace. O Judah, keep thy solemn feasts, perform thy vows, for the, for the wicked shall no more pass through thee. He is utterly cut off. So there's two kinds of wicked here. There's the wicked of what used to be in your own life, in their lives, in their own lives. And they're coming out of that. They're getting cleansed from that. The Lord is punishing them and bringing them out of it. He's a, a father that loves the child. And he's chastising the child. And that the child is coming out of it. And there's still some left. And... He, he points, he, this verse 15 points to the verse in Isaiah that's very similar to it. Behold upon the mountains the feet of him that brings good, good tidings, that publishes peace. Okay, now let's go to that in um, Isaiah 52. It's verse 7, 52 verse 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that brings good tidings, that publishes peace. That brings tidings, that brings good tidings of good. Good tidings of good. That publishes salvation. Again, season of salvation. 
that saith unto Zion, Thy God reigns. Okay? So to get a little more deeper into this, you got to say to Judah, Your God reigns. You're in Jerusalem. You got the temple. You got the, uh, Ark of the Cov Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies. And within that Ark, you got the cherubims, cherubims, uh, uh, point touching their wings, guarding it. And you, you got the mercy seat there. And you've got the Holy of Holies. And that's where he sits. Within you, Judah. And that's your God. And your God reigns. And that's, if you want to go deeper into, into, uh, Nahum 1, 15, you've got to turn over to ne uh, Isaiah 52, verse 7, which is, um, bef which in context, the context of that verse is even further up. Isaiah 52, 1. Awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion. Put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city, for henceforth thou shalt no more come unto thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. Those are the Ninevites. Those are the Assyrians that were coming up and afflicting them and hurting them and bothering them in this particular case for Nahum. Shake thyself from the dust, arise and sit down, O Jerusalem. Loose thyself from the bands of thy neck, O captive daughter of, of Zion. See, so it's a salvation again. It's salvation. It's getting loose. It's getting broken out. Setting the prisoner free. For thus saith the Lord, ye have sold yourselves for nothing, or naught, and ye shall redeem, you be redeemed without money. It didn't take money to, to buy them back. What did it take? Well, we'll get to that when we talk about the Redeemer. For thus saith the Lord God, my people went down aforetime into Egypt to sojourn there, and the Assyrian oppressed them without cause. So, they went into Egypt. Remember, there were seven heads of Egypt. It was the first head. Assyria it was the second head. Babylon is the third head of this great red dragon. And you talk about it's another subject. They oppressed them without cause. You see? Because there was a cause, a somewhat of a cause, when the Egyptians uh, did their bondage because the Lord wanted to bring them out. They wanted to, he wanted to redeem them out of that with a great strong hand so that they would know him as their savior and the same thing with the Assyrians coming up that was all allowed by God and it was a cause for the Assyrians to take and capture the Israelites who were who needed that chastisement as well but they go beyond what they were supposed to do and they are uh, become oppressing his people without cause and now therefore what I have here, saith the Lord, that my people is taken away for naught. They that rule over them make, make them to howl, says the Lord, and my name continually every day is blasphemed. Therefore my people shall know my name. Therefore in that day I am he that does speak. Behold, it is I. And then verse 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that brings good news. Good tidings. Good tidings. Good news. Gospel. All saying the same thing. And what's that? John 3.16 He's alive and we're alive in him. And we have salvation. As the next verse says. That publishes peace. Prince of Peace. Shalom to you. Brings good tidings of good. That publishes salvation. Season of salvation. Thus saith unto Zion, Thy God reigns. The watchmen shall lift up the voice. With the voice together they shall sing. For they shall see eye to eye. When the Lord shall bring again Zion. Okay. Uh, let's go back to Nahum. Nahum chapter 2, verse 1. He's still talking to Judah, and he says, he tells him that, He that dashes in pieces is come up before thy face. 
keep the munition, watch the way, make thy lungs strong, fortify thy power mightily. For the Lord has turned away the excellency of Jacob as the excellency of Israel, for the emptiers have emptied them out and marred their vine branches. So he's talking, he's telling Judah to make yourself strong. Because, and he's pointing that look what happened to the, your other brothers, your, your brothers in, in, the, in the north. He starts off in, in verse, in chapter 2, he that dashes in pieces has come up before thy face. Now verse 3 is again the same people that are dashing in pieces. The shield of his mighty men is made red, the valiant men are in scarlet, the, char the chariot shall be with flaming torches in the day of its preparation, and the fir tree shall be terribly shaken. The chariots shall rage in the streets, they shall jostle one against another in the broad ways, they shall seem like torches, they shall run like lightnings. He shall recount his worthies, they shall stumble in their walk, they shall make haste to the wall thereof, and defense shall be prepared. Okay, now, even though they're coming up in this terrible, mighty charge, it, it appears like uh, there's a turn. Verse 5, you see a, a turn. Because he's recounting his worthies or his brave men. And he has to recount them because they're, get, they're not, they're, they're, something is happening. They're losing. They shall stumble in their walk. They shall make haste to the wall thereof. And the defense shall be prepared. The gates of the rivers shall be opened. The palace shall be dissolved. So they start to lose the war right here. Now this verse 7, and Huzab shall be led away captive. She shall be brought up and her maid shall lead her with the voice of doves, doves tabering upon their breasts. So this is, this to me, this verse 7 here is, is letting me know that there's a, a part of the Assyrian, uh, complex that the Lord is going to save. I believe that this verse 7 is there's a remnant in the Assyrians that are going to be saved. And Chazav, Chazav, uh, is the root word of that Chazav means to stand. Okay? To stand. As in, as in he that endures up to the end shall be saved. That person that stands and Paul says, and above all, fight the fight of good, of faith and above all, stand. Okay? Make a stand. And I think that um, Huzav is a group that stands. And they're going to be led away captive. They'll be brought, she shall be brought up. Brought up. Okay? And her maid shall lead her as with the voice of doves tabering upon their breasts. Okay? Um... So a dove, a, the voice of a dove is a is a quiet voice, tapping upon their breasts, their hearts. There's there's a certain amount of leading the those that stand up out of the mire, you might say. And but but verse eight is is the uh, is the opposite. Verse eight is unlike Huzav. But Nineveh is of old like a pool of water, yet they shall flee away. Stand, stand, is a cry, but none shall look back. So, so notice that it's the reference to Nineveh uh, like a pool of water, and they shall flee away. So, in other words, like, like a pool of water, if you make a cut in the side, 
it spilled, the water all spilled out. Uh, he told Reuben, Jacob told Reuben, unstable art thou as water. And that's where we associate Reuben with this group of, of, uh, signs. And anyway, it's a pool of water. And, uh, I see the, that as the baptism pool of water. And they, that's, they're told to stand like Hutsa, like the name Hutsa, but they don't. Yet they flee away. Stand, stand, but none shall look back. In other words, they're fleeing away and nobody's looking back. They're not standing, in other words. They're those that endure unto the end. They're not enduring until the end. Fight the good fight of faith and above all to stand. And they're not standing. They're fleeing. They're running away. They're, they have the old pool of baptism and they are running away from it. Like the, like the pool is being dissolved and, and the water is spilling out of the pool. Nine, take ye the spoil of silver, take the spoil of gold, for there is none end of the store and glory out of all the pleasant furniture. Um, I think that has to do with um, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul. So this is the type that has plenty of gold and silver stored up, but it's not going to be, they're not going to be able to buy their, redeem their soul with any of that money. That's what Jesus said. She, ten, she is empty and void and waste and the heart melts and the knees smite, the knees smite together and much pain is in all loins and the faces of all them gather blackness. Okay, so there, there, uh, this fear, this, um, the heart's melting and the knees are smiting together and there's pain in all the loins. And so it's an aching, and their faces are gathering blackness. Verse 11, Where is the dwelling of thy lions, of the lions, and the feeding place of the young lions, where the lion of old lion, where the lion, even the old lion, walk, and, and the lions well, and none of them afraid. So he's got this, verse 11 is this picture of lions of all different ages, and verse 12 describes him as the lion did tear in pieces enough for his whelps and strangled for his lioness and filled his holes with prey and dens with, and the dens with raven. Verse 13 though says, but I am against thee, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will burn her chariots in the smoke and the sword shall devour thy young lions and I will cut off the prey from the earth, thy prey from the earth and the voice of thy messengers shall no more be heard. So, again, he's, Nineveh has described as, as being first described as this great company of lions that, that have their way with the beasts of the earth. But they're coming to the end here. Where, where God says, that's it, it's the end for you. I will cut thy young lions and I will cut thy prey from the earth and thy voice of thy messengers shall no more be heard. And then verse 3, she talks about this, uh, again, how Nineveh was a daughter of harlots from the daughter, from the mystery woman ba Babylon, who was the mother of harlots. She's another model city of her great empire. Woe to the bloody city it is full of lies and robbery. The Pray departs not. The noise of a whip, the noise of rattling of the wheels, and the prancing horses, and the jumping chariots. The horseman lifts up both the bright sword and the glittering spear, and there is a multitude of slain, great number of carcasses. There is none end of their corpses. They stumble because of their corpses. Because of the multitudes of the whoredoms of the well-favored harlot, the mistress of witchcrafts that sells nations through her whoredoms, and families through her witchcrafts. Behold, I am against thee, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will discover thy skirt upon thy face, and I will show the nations thy nakedness, 
in the kingdoms thy shame. And I will cast abominable filth upon thee, and make thee vile, and set thee as a gazing stock. And it shall come to pass that as they look upon thee, they shall flee from thee and say, Nineveh is laid waste. Who will bemoan her? Whence I shall seek her comforters for thee. Art thou better than populous? No. Populous is a, a, a name of an Egyptian god. And so is the, the word no. Is, it doesn't mean no. Like we say yes and no. It, it's a name of a god. And that's sort of like, um, it is just, just think of it as an Egyptian god reference there. That was situated among the rivers that had the waters around, around about it, whose rampart was the sea and who, and her wall was from the sea. Ethiopia and Egypt were her strength and it was infinite. Put and Lubun, Rubim were thy helpers, yet, was she carried away, she went into captivity, her young children also were dashed in pieces at the top of all the streets. They cast lots for her honorable men, and all her great men were bound in chains. Thou also shalt be drunken, thou shalt be hid, thou shalt be, thou also shalt seek strength because of the enemy. All thy strongholds shall be like Fig trees with first ripe figs, that if they be shaken, they shall even fall to the mouth of the eater. Okay, again, he's talking now to the Ninevites. So you have a stronghold, and it's all of the, you know, all of a sudden, it's not such a stronghold, it's a, it's a, a fig tree, uh, it's, it's almost, you know, the enemy comes up to it and he just shakes the tree and he eats figs off of it. That's how much of a stronghold it is uh, by keeping him away. Behold, thy people in the midst of thee are women. In other words, you have a woman to defend yourself. The gates of thy land shall be set wide open in thy enemies. The fire shall divide thy devour thy, thy bars. Draw thee waters for the siege. Fortify the strongholds. Go into clay and tread water and make strong the brickmen. Now he's, he's telling them, go ahead and start to dig in and into a defensive mode. Verse, verse 14. 15. There shall, there shall the fire devour thee, the sword shall cut thee off, it shall eat thee like a canker worm, make thyself many, make thyself many as the canker worm, make thyself many as locusts. And you know he's still talking about the Assyrians because verse 18. Thy shepherds slumber, O king of Assyria. Thy nobles shall dwell in the dust. Thy people is scattered upon the mountains, and no man gathers, gathers them. There is no healing of thy bruise. Thy wound is grievous. All that, all that hear the brood of, thy, of thee shall clap their hands over thee. For upon whom hath not thy wickedness passed continually? So. Upon whom has not thy wickedness passed continually? Everywhere you go, everywhere you look, there's going to be people that your wickedness has continually battered them time and time again. And everywhere you go upon the face of the earth, there's going to be your wickedness upon people. And that's the why, that's the reason why there is no healing of your bruise. There is the wound is grievous. All that hear the brute of thee shall clap the hands over thee. And that's the reason why Jonah was sent to talk to them, to let them know that the Lord was going to destroy them. But there was a repentance. But in this case, this is years, this is generations after that. Uh, in this time. There is no healing of thy bruise. The wound is grievous. All that hear the brood of thee shall clap their hands over thee. Everybody's going to be glad to see the destruction of this wickedness of Assyria.